Testing one, two. There we go. Good morning. My name is Brian Keepers, and I'm one of the pastors here at Trinity. And uh, again, just welcome. It's so great to have you all with us, and, and welcome back to the college students. It's wonderful to see some faces that I recognize and also some new faces this morning. So the Bible is God's story. It renders to us the story of who God is and how God is at work bringing about his mission in and for the world. God is the central actor in this story. God is the real hero of this story. And yet in the Bible, we also find a lot of other characters who play supporting roles who find themselves drawn up into the story. They have a part to play. Throughout the summer, we have been hearing about some of these different stories of those whose lives were caught up by faith into this larger story of God. And for our summer sermon series here at Trinity, we used Hebrews chapter 11, really is our, our primary uh, scripture, in, in which we heard from this kind of roll call of faith all these different heroes of the faith. We, we heard stories about Abraham and Sarah, um, Isaac and Rebecca, Jacob and Rachel, uh, we heard stories about Joseph and his brothers, about Moses and the people of God crossing the Red Sea. There were surprises in Hebrews 11, like Rahab the prostitute who makes the roll call, an unexpected person. We heard stories about judges like Gideon and, um, and Deborah and Barak. And we heard, stories, um, we heard stories about prophets like Elijah and Jonah. And last Sunday, we heard the story of David, Israel's greatest king, uh, a poet and a mighty warrior, a man after God's own heart. Well, we only have a couple weeks left in this sermon series, and if you're just kind of getting in on the end of it, um, I, I have you in mind this morning, so so that you'll feel like you're part of this. Um, but what I want you know, what I want you to know about Hebrews chapter 11 is that it helps maybe to think about Hebrews, the whole book, but but especially this chapter is a sermon, <laughs> and that the writer of Hebrews is is this passionate preacher, and. As Hebrews 11 comes to an end, uh, the conclusion, it's, it's almost like this, this passionate preacher, he, he begins to raise his voice in this feverish pitch as, it, as, it, as he builds momentum. And, and after naming all of these different heroes of the faith, he gets to a point where he can hardly contain himself, and he says, well, you know, what else can I say? And he goes on to talk about all these unnamed people who experienced great adversity and persecution because of their faith. And I want you to hear this last part then of Hebrews chapter 11 this morning. And I'm gonna begin at verse 32. And here's what the, here's what the preacher says. Again, you gotta kind of almost imagine this as a, a call and response kind of sermon. Um, and what more shall I say, he says, for there were others who were tortured, refusing to be released so that they might gain an even better resurrection. Some faced jeers and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in sheepskins and goatskins, destitute, persecuted, and mistreated. The world was not worthy of them, for they wandered in deserts and mountains, living in caves and in holes in the ground. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Well, God, we thank you for your word and for your spirit. And we pray that you would open the eyes of our heart this morning, Lord, that your spirit would move in this place in such a way that we would be able to see what is true through the eyes of faith. Lord, that our faith might be built up so that we might serve you in this world. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and all of God's people said, amen. So the preacher, the writer of Hebrews, lists these unnamed people who had this incredible courage in the face of suffering and adversity. And I want to share with you then a story this morning about a man in the Bible um, who, who also demonstrates incredible faith in the midst of persecution. Now, throughout this series this summer, we've primarily heard stories about those who were in the Old Testament, but today I want to cross over into the New Testament. And I want to tell you the story about a man named Stephen. Stephen's story uh, can be found in the, the New Testament book of Acts. It's Acts chapter six through, through eight is where you would find it. 
And, and let me give you a little bit of context, and then I want you to just hear this part of the story. So the church continued to grow in Jerusalem. And as it continued to grow, um, what happened is, is the church continued to draw people from the margins, and they were welcomed into the family of God. And with the growth of the church, there were also particular needs um, that began to increase, especially among the poor and among those who were widows. And so the apostles, who were the ones, they were the leaders who had walked with Jesus and, and were eyewitnesses to Christ during his life, um, they were providing all the care at that time for these widows who were in need, and they got to a point where that just the demand of that, they knew that they couldn't care well for those widows without neglecting um, being devoted to prayer and teaching God's word. And so what they do is they, they prayerfully select seven people um, who, and this is Luke's description in Acts, who had hearts that were full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit, full of faith and full of the Holy Spirit, and they commission them to care for these widows. They become deacons, and Stephen is one of those who's called to do this. Now, as the story continues to go, um, what happens is there's greater and greater resistance to this movement of, 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 of Christianity. And among the Jewish religious leaders, um, because the Christians were confessing that Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah, um, the, the, the religious leaders began to charge them with blasphemy. And Stephen is one of those who gets charged with blasphemy, and he's brought before these religious leaders, and, and, he's, and he's kind of, you know, he's charged with these accusations. And what happens in Acts chapter 7 is that in this moment um, of being charged with these accusations, the Spirit fills Stephen, and courageously he bears witness to Christ. And, and he testifies to Christ, and he preaches this sermon. It's actually kind of a long sermon. Um, and when he gets done, uh, you really, I guess you could say it wasn't all that successful if your measurement of success is how well people respond. Um, it was not one of those sermons where people came rushing up to him afterwards and say, Pastor, thank you so much for that sermon. That's exactly what I needed to hear. Uh, in, in fact, it, it riled them up. Let me share with you this part of the story from the book that we love, Acts chapter 7. This is towards the end. I'm going to invite you to just listen to it. When he had finished saying these things, and, and he being Stephen, saying these things means preaching that Christ is the Messiah and calling them to repent, they, the religious leaders, were enraged. And they grinded their teeth. Isn't that a great image? They grinded their teeth against him. But filled with the Holy Spirit, Stephen gazed into heaven and he saw the glory of God and he saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God look he said for the heavens have been opened and I see the son of man standing at the right hand of God but when he said this they covered their ears and they rushed against him and they dragged him out of the city and they began to stone him now, those witnesses there laid coats down at the feet of a young man named Saul. And while Stephen was being stoned, he prayed this prayer. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he knelt down and he cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And after he spoke these words, he died. Now Saul approved the killing of Stephen. And on that day, persecution began in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout the countryside of Judea and Samaria. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. It's a, it's a hard story, don't you think? And, and maybe one that's, that's difficult for us to connect with uh, as Christians who live in the United States, and especially for those of us who, who live in Northwest Iowa. I'm, I'm guessing that most of us this morning, maybe not everybody, but I'm guessing that most of us this morning haven't experienced persecution 
because of our faith in the same way that Stephen experienced persecution. Um, in fact, we live in a culture here, especially in Northwest Iowa, where maybe we're even rewarded because of our faith, right? I mean, it's, it's not necessarily something that, that we get ostracized for or that we're going to experience imprisonment or even death because of it. However, throughout the history of the church and even today, you need to know that there are Christians around the world who continue to be beaten and imprisoned, tortured, and even killed for their faith. I, I was on the website this morning called Open Doors, which kind of keeps their pulse on Christians around the world. And did you realize um, that there are, I gotta get this number exactly right. I know what I wanna say in my head, but I, uh, 245 million, 245 million Christians who are living in places around the world today where there are high levels of persecution. Did you know that, that, that every day 11 Christians are killed because of their faith? And that in this year alone, we're only halfway through it, that they, they, they approximate that 4,305 Christians have been killed because of their faith. That's, that's hard for us, perhaps, to relate to. And still, even if we may not experience persecution in the same way that Stephen did or that others do around the world today, I, I think that, that Stephen's example becomes instructive for us in terms of what it means to live by faith what it means to be courageous witnesses. That's what Christ calls us all to be, is courageous witnesses. How do you stand firm in your faith, especially in the midst of adversity and suffering? I mean, the, the reality is, is that when we're courageous in our faith, it will lead us into places of op opposition, into tension, into conflict, um, and, and if not opposition from others, the Bible tells us that when we are seeking to be obedient to Christ, we can count on that there is an enemy who's gonna try to thwart God's purposes. So in, in the time that we have together this morning, I, I wanna just lift up for you um, four, four things that I think that we can learn from Stephen's example about what it might look like for us to live as people who have courageous faith. Here's the first Luke, who wrote the book of Acts, tells us that Stephen was filled with the Holy Spirit. I mean, first and foremost, and, and Luke tells us this even back in Acts 6, that this characterized Stephen's life, that he was a man who was filled with the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit. See, don't you see that faith and courage is not something that you and I can just muster up by our own determination and willpower. But faith is a gift, and it comes only when the Spirit continues to fill us with his presence and his power. So here's, here's kind of how this works, and there's a lot more that I could say about this, but let me just kind of give you a sense of what it means to be filled with the Spirit, is that when we say yes to God's grace, and when we enter into a relationship with Christ, what happens is the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in our hearts so that Christ is present in us and we are in Christ, we have union with Christ by the power of that Spirit. And the Spirit fills us, but it's, it's a dynamic kind of filling. So, Ben DeBoer, hey Ben, it's good to see you man. Can you, would you come up? So maybe here's, here's an illustration. Um, so Ben, I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask you to, um, I know that you're full of a lot of hot air. Thanks. I'm gonna ask you to just <laughs> blow up this balloon, but, but when I tell you to stay, when I tell you to stop, stop, and then, and then I'm gonna have you hold it up. Okay, stop. So when we say yes to God's grace and enter into a relationship with Christ, we're filled with the Holy Spirit. The Spirit comes to reside in our hearts. So would you, would you say that this balloon is, is, is full of the Spirit? It, it is. It is, right? Don't, it's, not necessarily like a, it's not necessarily like a glass in which we think that, okay, you know, we gotta get filled with the Spirit and then once it kinda hits capacity, it's done. That's not the dynamic way that this works. You would say that, well, yes, this, this, this balloon is filled with the Spirit, but it has the capacity to be filled with more air, right? So do you wanna continue to blow it up, Ben? I think he needs a little bit of encouragement. Um, this, come on, Ben. Man, Ben, you are such a talented guy. Keep, keep going, Thanks, keep, 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 keep going, keep going. So as we open our, our, our hearts, and this is part of what, you know, we're, we're invited to open, keep, keep going, man. As we're invited to open our hearts to the Spirit's ongoing filling in our lives, what happens is that it continues to increase our capacity 
to be filled more and more with the Spirit in such a way that we grow in our faith and our courage. Do you see how that works? Now, I don't know about you, but for me, I think one of the things that often happens, hold on to that, is that I experience the presence of the Spirit maybe this much in my life, and I say, okay, I'm, I'm good. <laughs> because often it can be scary for us to open ourselves up to be filled more and more with the presence of the Spirit because then suddenly we're not in control and, and where may the Spirit lead us and my, what, what might the Spirit call us to? And yet this is what a life of faith is about, of asking God to come more and more, fill my life with your presence and power so that I might be faithful to the calling that you've put on my life. Stephen is filled with the Spirit, and it's the Spirit then that continues to give him courage in the midst of adversity. Thanks, Ben. You, you truly are incredibly talented. Thank you. So, <laughs> yeah, you can clap for Ben. So Stephen is filled with the Spirit. Let, here's, here's my question then for you, if you could put the question up there. Is, uh, how, might you be, how might you be opening yourself up to being filled more and more with the Holy Spirit's presence and power in your life? What's keeping you from being more open to the presence and power of the Spirit? Because Stephen was filled with the Spirit, then what happened is that God opened the eyes of his heart and enabled him to see from a different perspective. God enabled him to see beyond his immediate circumstances, that here he is, this, this, this horrible kind of moment in his life. I mean, Luke says, while he was being stoned, God gives him another perspective, opens the eyes of his heart, and he's able to see. I mean, what happens is that he sees heaven being opened, and he sees that, 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 that Christ is at the right hand of God. He sees that Jesus is exalted as the king, that he is Lord. And it's, it's something similar to what the Holy Spirit does to the Apostle John when he's exiled on the island of Patmos. John wrote the book of Revelation, the last book in the Bible, and it's a similar thing that in that moment, and there's all this suffering that's happening in the world, there's all of this pain and this injustice in the world, and yet he's caught up in the Spirit, and, and, and what happens, I mean, Revelation literally means unveiling, and, and what happens is that the veil is pulled back, and John is able to see that no matter how dark things may seem at the present time, that Christ sits on the throne, that Christ is Lord. So I, was, I took this sheet, and I was just thinking about what are things that tend to obscure our vision? Um, what are things that tend to kind of get in the way and, and, and we find ourselves kind of putting our heads down instead of lifting our eyes up? And I put things like fear and, and death and violence, um, pain, sin, sickness. Um, sometimes they can be things like worldly gain and like power. Um, maybe it's, you know, something like anxiety or loss. I don't know what it is for you. What is it for you right now that, that is consuming your mind and your heart and, and it's discouraging you and it's obscuring your vision and when the Holy Spirit fills us with his presence and power, what happens is that this veil is pulled back in the same way that it was for Stephen. I like that. <laughs> the veil is pulled back in the same way that it was for Stephen, and Stephen is able to fix his gaze and see, again through the eyes of faith, that Christ is on the throne. That there is nothing that is happening in his life or in this world that somehow is beyond the sovereign control of God. And what it means when Christ is on the throne, when he fixes his focus on that, it gives him the courage to be able to see beyond whatever pain and adversity he's facing in that moment. Here's something that you know, but I'll just say it to you. Whatever you fix your attention on, Wherever you fix your focus, that will shape the direction of your life right now. How's your vision? What are you fixing your focus on? You know, this vision of heaven, uh, you, you know this saying, you've, you've heard it before, that sometimes Christians can be so heavenly minded that they are no earthly good. Have you heard that saying, some of us? That, we, that, that this idea of being heavenly minded, we think that somehow it's, it, it takes us out of the world. And, but that's not really what we see with Stephen or really what it means to have a biblical vision of heaven. It's just the opposite, that when we're heavenly minded, when we focus, the, when we, we focus our attention on Christ as the reigning king, 
in God's intent for the world, what it does is it, it, it empowers us, it encourages us to do earthly good, to join God in his mission, to bring about his redemptive purposes for this world. I love the way that C.S. Lewis puts this in his book, Mere Christianity. He says, a continual looking forward to the eternal world, so to heaven, is not a form of escapism or wishful thinking, but one of the things a Christian is meant to do. It does not mean that we are to leave the present world as it is. If you read history, you will find that the Christians who did the most for the present world were just those who thought the most about the next. All left their mark on earth precisely because their minds were occupied with heaven. It is since Christians have largely ceased to think about this other world or to fix their focus on heaven, on Christ on his throne, that they have become so ineffective in this world. Aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in, but aim at earth and you will get neither. Where's your focus? Where are you fixing your attention? Wherever your focus is, it will shape the direction of your life right now. Stephen was filled with the Spirit. He was given a focus, focused on this vision of heaven, of Christ on the throne, and it's because he knew that Christ was on the throne that it freed him to fully surrender himself to Christ. Luke tells us that when he was being stoned, in that moment, as he fixed his vision on Christ, that he found the freedom to surrender his spirit to Jesus, to surrender the outcome. He prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Surrender that is not about giving up, but it's about giving over and entrusting our lives, entrusting the things that we carry, entrusting the things that consume us with worry and anxiety, being able to, to, to entrust these to Christ, we let them go, we surrender them to him. What is it that you need to surrender today? What do you need to let go of? What do you need to put in the hands of Christ? Christ to entrust him with your life, to entrust him with the outcome of something right now. I came across this prayer this week, and I've been praying it every day. Could you put it up there for me? By Charles de Facul. And you may want to take a picture of this with your phone. I, I challenge you to pray this every day. This is a radical prayer. Father, I abandon myself into your hands. Do with me what you will. Whatever you may do, I will thank you. I am ready for all. I accept all. Let only your will be done in me as in all your creatures, and I will ask nothing else, my Lord. <laughs> I've been praying that every day. Ask me how it's going. Not so well. That's really hard, but it's worth praying it, and the prayer of it is helping me posture myself more and more to surrender. Father, I abandon myself into your hands. I give it to you. Stephen was filled with the Spirit, which opened his eyes to be focused on this vision of Christ on the throne, which freed him to fully surrender himself and his circumstances to Christ. And this is the last thing that I want to say this morning as we wrap up. And that enabled him then to forgive those who were hurting him. And I think that this is the part of Stephen's story that's, I think it's his most powerful witness. You know, Stephen testifies through his words about Christ, and he preaches this wonderful sermon. He preaches the gospel, but it's in this moment when everything, he had every right to retaliate, every right um, to, to want to seek vengeance in that moment, every right to curse them for what they were doing to him. And yet, because he experienced the power of God's forgiveness in Christ. He chose to forgive. He does the gospel in this moment. I mean, that's the heart of the gospel, is forgiveness of what Christ has done for us so that we might be forgiven, and then we receive this power that's beyond us to be able to turn around and forgive others. Here's what he prays. He cries out, Father, Lord, do not hold this against them. Forgiveness does not mean 
that what somebody does to us is okay. Can I just be clear about that this morning? Because some of us have experienced some pretty painful things. It does not mean that a person shouldn't be held accountable. It doesn't mean that somebody's not responsible. Forgiveness is not opposed to justice. Forgiveness and justice go hand in hand. They go together, but there's a difference. There's a difference. There's a difference between justice and vengeance. And forgiveness, because Stephen surrenders himself to Christ and surrenders his desire to get even, he's entrusting that God is the one who will settle the score, that God alone is the judge, and he's able to forgive. One of the things that I find fascinating about his prayer, by the way, and, and it, reflects, it reflects the prayer of Jesus on the cross. Did you notice that? I mean, this is what Jesus does on the cross when he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You, you hear Stephen praying a similar prayer, and the thing that strikes me is that both for Jesus and Stephen, their prayer isn't, you know, Lord, I forgive them, but, but their prayer is, God, you forgive them. And what I found in my own life when forgiveness is really hard is that the first step for me even when I feel like I'm not ready to forgive, is to be able to pray, to choose to pray, God, would you forgive? Lord, I'm, I'm maybe not at that place right now, but would you forgive? And it's, it's often that prayer that gets us on this journey of learning to forgive. Forgiveness is a process that takes time. But we can do it by the power of God in us. So let me ask you this last question. I wonder, is there somebody who God is calling you to forgive? Are you harboring a grudge? Are you holding on to a resentment that's like a cancer in you that will just continue to eat you up from the inside out? What would it look like for you today to even take that step of praying, God, I just, please help me. Help me to let this go. Would you forgive? Help me to get on this journey of forgiving myself. He was filled with the Spirit. He focused his vision on heaven. He fully surrendered himself to Christ. And he testified to the power of the gospel by choosing to forgive his enemies. You may not ever be asked to die for your faith. But G.K. Chesterton, a British writer, in his biography on St. Francis of Assisi, said St. Francis never died for his faith, but he did make martyrdom a way of life that he lived the life of a martyr. We may not be called to die the fate of a martyr, but we are all called to live the faith of a martyr. To die to ourselves, that's what baptism is about. Ben talked about that earlier. To die to our own ego, to die to our selfishness, to die to our sin, our insecurity, to die to our fear in order that we might be raised to Christ, raised to new life in Christ. And what made the martyrs like Stephen, I think, so inspiring was not necessarily the death that they died, but it was the life that they lived. A life lived for the praise of God's glory. A life lived to point others to Christ. I mean, Jesus said it himself this way, that whoever wants to find their life, some of you know this, must do what? Lose it. But whoever loses their life for me, and for the sake of my kingdom will find it. This is the call of faith. This is the call of discipleship. Let's pray. O oh Lord, we ask that you would fill us with your spirit today. And Lord, that you would give us this vision, that you would help us focus our attention beyond our current circumstances, but to see that, Jesus, you are Lord. You are the one who even now is exalted as king. That even now you are working to be, bring restoration to this world. And Lord, we ask that you would help us to surrender to you, to trust you, and that you would give us the power to forgive. Lord, whatever you want to do in us this morning, I pray that you would stir in us, God, that you would give us faith, that you would give us courage as we seek to follow you. We ask all of this in the name of Christ and all God's people said, amen. Well, I wanna invite you to stand for the benediction this morning.
And Jimmy, I'm going to invite you to come up here with me. Jimmy, so this is Jimmy Tidmore. And some of you know Jimmy, uh, graduated from Northwestern this last year. And Jimmy is, is getting ready to, I think the plan is to head to West Michigan here in the next several weeks, hopefully, something like that. Um, and is continuing to discern the possibility that God's calling him to seminary. Um, and so he's been an intern with us through the summer. It's just been a delight to have him. And, uh, and as part of our benediction and prayer this morning, I want to just pray a blessing for you as we send you into this next chapter. So let's pray. I'd encourage you to just put out your, your hands like this. Lord, we thank you for Jimmy. God, thank you for the call that you put on his life and just for the gift that it has been to, to have him as part of Northwestern's uh, community and a part of our community here at Trinity. And Lord, we pray that your spirit would lead him and go with him as he prepares for this next chapter. Oh Lord, that you would come around him. Uh, Father, that you would prepare the way for him. And Lord, we just, we just ask your blessing upon him today. It's in the name of Christ that we pray. Amen. Hey, let us go from this place with the grace of the Lord Jesus, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Spirit. Go in peace to serve the Lord.